I uh, hope everyone is having a great morning. Uh, you know, if we would have known that uh, we would have had so many folks showing up, uh, we probably would have went to a, a, a different a different area. But uh, you know, so glad you're all here this morning. Uh, from, for those of you that I don't know, uh, I am Mayor Quentin Hart uh, from the great city of Waterloo. And I was trying to tell our out-of-town guests, uh, we tried to hold off on the sunshine as much as we could <laughs> uh, over the last couple days. But you know, what an incredible uh, week we've had. Uh, my Waterloo days was this weekend. Uh, we had beautiful sunshine all the way through as opposed to last year when it rained the second and third day. So just, very, just, just such a great time, a, a great time to be in the city of Waterloo. And uh, you know, first I want to thank. Um, we have some some out of town, out of town guests that I'll talk about uh, in just a moment or two. Uh, but you know, I, I was asked a question uh, yesterday uh, in a conversation, and it was kind of interesting because it was out of all the places to choose to to be at, choose to grow. Uh, why Waterloo? And you know, I started thinking about that question. And one of the reasons that I ran for Waterloo, I mean, ran for mayor, uh, was because of the thought, why not Waterloo? Uh, we have so much incredible potential uh, as a city, as a community. Uh, we're moving in the right direction in so many cylinders. And yes, like other communities, we have some challenge. But our strength, our strength comes from our ability to be able to work together, to have tough conversations, and to take a long range look at our community and roll our sleeves up and see where we can get in uh, to fit in to make this a, a even greater community. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here. Uh, but the occasion this morning uh, is not necessarily to sit up and, and listen to my uh, rambling about how great of a community that we have. The occasion is uh, to focus on the Waterloo Opportunity Zone. And for about the last year and a half, I had the opportunity to hook up uh, with a, a group uh, by the name of Accelerator for America. And last year, last year, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti um, visited the city of Waterloo. Um, his wife's family and grandparents are actually, were actually uh, born in the city of Waterloo. And so we had an opportunity to talk. We visited uh, Cedar Valley Tech Works. And you know, uh, Mayor Garcetti was so excited about seeing the happenings that are taking place in a small community like Waterloo, Iowa. And then I had the fortune and opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Rick Jacobs, who will come up a little bit earlier. And they have a program and project called Accelerator for America. And from my perspective, and they'll give you, give you a, a, a better understanding of the accelerator, but we have challenges uh, on our federal level. But when it comes to making an impact, it's cities, it's mayors, and it's community people like all of you here that are making the difference every day to move our community forwards. You know, cities have been the incubators of technology and innovation of development and redevelopment of blighted areas that need our very much support. And so I had an opportunity to travel with the Accelerator for America and Aaron as well and visit cities throughout this entire United States from Philadelphia uh, to Birmingham and all the way to Palo Alto and other places throughout this country where people are focusing on the real needs that are taking place that, that they have in their communities. And what's more important is this vehicle of opportunity zones. And opportunity zones, in case you don't know, um, was, oh, I guess I'm supposed to do this uh, clicker thing too at the same time. <laughs> Oh, oh, this morning, uh, our, uh, one of our sponsors this morning, let me go back and do some housekeeping. <laughs> uh, it's ISG. Uh, they've been a great sponsor and a great uh, community partner. And they're also doing uh, the entire building audit uh, for the city of Waterloo, looking at all our buildings and seeing what we can do to improve them. And one of them is the convention, uh, the, uh, convention center. So you'll all be hearing about that a little bit later as well. 
Um, but once again, with Opportunity Zones, we also have uh, WSP here as well this morning uh, with John Porcari, uh, who's president of U.S. Advisory Services. If you could please stand, uh, John. Uh, we have Stuart Sunshine uh, here, senior vice president and director of state and local government affairs uh, with WSP. And we have Andrew Petrison. Did I get that right? Yes. Close? Okay. Patterson, if you would please stand up, who uh, works with the U.S. Advisory Services and as the associate consultant, but uh, he is their Opportunity Zones guru. And we also have Mr. Rick Jacobs, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. Yes, please stand. Um, Rick is here uh, on behalf of the Accelerator for America, and we have Mr. Aaron Thomas, who, uh, who is one of the sharpest dressed <laughs> so I have to step my game up when uh, Aries are around, <laughs> who uh, also is with the Opportunity Zone. So um, just great to have them. And, you know, we have everything from Washington to uh, uh, sunny California uh, in here as well. So um, thank you. But back to what I was saying, uh, uh, in 2000, uh, the, the, federal, the Federal Opportunity Zones program offers investors a capital gains tax reduction in exchange for investing uh, capital gains income into designated census tracts known as opportunity zones. Uh, and in fact, investors can defer and reduce realized capital gains on the principles invested and eliminate their capital gains tax burden on returns uh, earned through the sale of investments in qualified opportunity zones. And the zones are compromised, uh, comp com comprised uh, of U.S. census tracts where uh, the poverty rate is 20% or greater, or the family income is less than 80% of the area's median income. And the governors of each state had an opportunity to uh, designate opportunity zones. So a couple years ago, we put forth uh, probably about five or six different areas that we believe fit uh, this designation and our governor chose three of the particular uh, zones that uh, we'll have a concentration on but you know these the zones that we're talking about uh, mostly are um, um, has a median income that I just mentioned um, unemployment rates that are um, severely impacted and also these are communities with heavy concentrations of uh, minorities within our communities as well. So this is a great partnership and a great opportunity, but over the last year or so in discussions locally, um, people were asking, well, how can I be involved? How can I be engaged? I know, Kay, we've had a series of uh, different meetings and conversations all throughout. And so this is an opportunity for those of you uh, without the familiarity to be able to learn a little bit more about Opportunity Zones, what it can possibly do, but also to have our visitors kind of explain some of the best practices and things they've seen throughout this country that, that, that cities are doing uh, that are incredible, incredible opportunities. And so probably about two months ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Palo Alto uh, California with the accelerator and uh, the only way that you can actually attend was if you had a, an approved uh, Opportunity Zone prospectus because what good is it to tell investors we can do this and you can do that when they don't necessarily understand the community or understand the opportunities that we have located in parts of our Opportunity Zone. So we wanted to bring all of you here together today from whatever capacity you're in, from our foundations to our invest, investment agencies, to our banking agencies, to our community development and those that are interested in redevelopment, uh, to housing. But bring everyone here together uh, today so that we can maximize this great opportunity to transform the city of Waterloo in ways that we couldn't have possibly imagined that we can do uh, for our future. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring uh, Noel Anderson. Uh, wait, f first of all, um, Jane, Jane, I'm sorry, Jane, please, please stand up. 
and Steve, Steve Eggleston as well. But Jane is from, Jane and Steve is from the SBA as well, right? And what's your title? And Steve is the director of HUD. So Steve is the director of HUD the, the, for Iowa? Okay, because that was like, Carson, you. And Jane, you are the regional? District Director of, for Iowa and um, Steve is my counterpart as well. Yeah. So I know Conley, Deputy Director, District Director for SBA. All right. And Joe Ecker was um, branch manager for the SBA. All right. And Peter Robinson. And so, so we thank you all for being here as well. And I want to be remiss. And Jane gave us a great award last year. Um, was it last year? Or was it 19 or last 18? Year. Okay, last year, uh, Waterloo, Iowa was voted the, um, or was awarded the uh, Small Business Community of the Year Award by the SBA, so that is, that is a huge deal for us. So without further ado, I'm rambling right now. I'm going to uh, ask Noel Anderson to come up and talk about our prospectus. Good morning, everyone. You know, if you know my normal role with the city of Waterloo at council meetings and talking, generally when we have a room full of people, it's not a good thing. So, <laughs> it's always good to hear. So this is a good crowd. Glad to have you here. Um, as I noted, I'm Noel Anderson. I'm the Community Planning and Development Director for the city of Waterloo. Um, and I'm here to kind of talk to you a little bit about <coughs> the city of Waterloo's opportunity zones. If anyone would like a map of the opportunity zones, Adrian, can you pass those out? Um, we'll have one, and they'll both show the opportunity zones on them in purple. Um, they're on some of the slides here as well. Um, and then some of them will actually so, show the opportunity zones on <coughs> the new market tax credits. Um, Adrian, if you just want to pass them out as the same map, just because there's so many people here. Um, as the mayor noted, um, the state issued a map of eligible areas when they started the process for the opportunity zones from the federal legislation. Um, there was basically kind of tier one areas and tier two areas. Tier one areas were eligible census tracts, and the tier two areas were areas next to the eligible census tracts. Um, so the city of Waterloo, knowing that it was going to be a highly competitive uh, process, um, su submitted the, uh, the tier one areas as our areas for trying. We essentially, I'm going to flip through a couple of slides just to get to the map. <coughs> you can see on the map the three areas that were, were chosen um, are in the middle of the city there, um, downtown Waterloo, an area just east of there, and then along the LaPorte Road corridor. Um, we were eligible, to, we were able to submit for four census tracts, um, thinking that we would get one or two, knowing that there'd only be 62 in the entire state. Um, we were fortunate to receive three of those um, in, in good areas. Why did the city submit the ones that we submitted? We tried to look at the statistics that the mayor noted a little bit on in terms of the poverty area and the incomes, which ones we thought had the best chance in terms of that criteria. We also tried to look at areas that would have um, sites in there for redevelopment, um, city-owned properties in there that matched with our other incentive, local incentive zones. Um, census Tract 1 is downtown Waterloo. a lot of the positive things that we have happening in downtown Waterloo. The next uh, opportunity zone we have is Census Tract 7, um, going from East 6th Street along the riverfront to 11, along Franklin, and then back to the railroad tracks. Again, we chose that one um, because of the proximity and the positive things happening in downtown Waterloo. It also contains a lot of nice little infill sites in there. Um, along the corridors as well as riverfront properties for redevelopment. And if you know me, I just kind of flip back and forth all around to, to kind of get to the, the slides I want, sorry. The third opportunity zone that we worked on is Census Track 10 along the LaPorte Road corridor, 
again, going from Ridgeway to the south, Hawthorne to the north, to Hammond, and then the Fort Road. And again, why did we look at these? The statistics that we have in the prospectus, um, I'll go back to now, sorry about that. I think I'm supposed to point that way. And we have a lot of the information in the prospectus um, to talk about the commercial vacancy rates, the residential vacancy rates, um, the different information as to why they qualified um, the, jump, the zones, the jobs, um, the vacancies, the population. So again, a lot of that information we've tried to provide to you ahead of time, especially if you're going for other funding sources that you may need that information for as you're working on projects. For downtown Waterloo Opportunity Zone specifically, um, we have a large amount of activity in there. Um, recent projects of mixed use buildings with first floor commercial, multiple historic renovations throughout the district. Um, riverfront amenities planned and ongoing right nearby to downtown or to the west side of downtown, we call it now, is the marina development will be happening. Um, over 25 new small business starts are happening in downtown Waterloo. Uh, the city of Waterloo is active in eliminating blight and acquiring uh, properties for future redevelopment. Um, we've helped some projects recently acquire some land um, and eliminate blight at the same time. So again, we're active in providing city-owned lots for potential projects as well. Um, there's also privately owned land out there for sale and redevelopment at times. And again, as you're looking at projects or looking at the area, um, let us know what you're thinking and planning, and we'll see how we can help. Um, we have hotel opportunities. We have the, the convention center. The mayor talked about a little bit more that the city is, is already obligating $2.5 million this year for renovations into the convention center with more planned in the near future. Um, there's sites nearby for that. Um, infill sites, um, as well as the nice thing about our opportunity zones too is that they overlay um, a lot of our other local incentives. Um, we have tax increment financing districts. Generally, the city gives out tax rebates. There's a potential for grants. There's a potential for city-owned land or the city to help acquire land for those projects. Um, there's historic tax credits in a lot of the downtown area and the nearby area will help you with there's brownfield grayfield tax credits and again the city actually has three active historic uh, studies underway to designate properties to help properties to be able to achieve those tax credits if any of you were recently um, at the uh, east third street uh, ribbon cutting um, of that renovation of the judge platt uh, building it's a beautiful building again in an area within the opportunity zone As I noted on the, the, the larger map with the green areas, um, the opportunity zones are also all eligible new market tax credit areas. So again, for the larger projects where that may make some sense, we've also been in contact with Iowa Business Growth in the Des Moines area. They also help with smaller projects for the new market tax credit area. So again, if you're looking at that, that's able to help. Um, shown on this map here, on the, on the bottom side here, um, these are city-owned lots. You can see a potential drawing from our bank loan associates downtown uh, consultants that help us kind of lay out plan things. Here's the single speed development. Here's the upper plaza building. Local developer Brent Dahlstrom is building the upper plaza called the Art Block Building. Um, they actually went through and changed the LLC name on our development agreement. Uh, the city council is approving of that um, so that they can take advantage of the opportunity zone. So we already have some local developers utilizing this, this, new, this new incentive. Walnut neighborhood, as we noted, <coughs> excuse me, as we noted, this is just north of downtown. Um, you can kind of see a drawing up here. Um, some of the houses that are going to be renovated in there. The Judge Platt House I noticed a little bit earlier. Um, this is an area just north of downtown. The city of Waterloo is already partnering with JSA uh, Development from downtown. They're going to be restoring four historic houses in that area, use, utilizing historic tax credits. We do have a historic study over the entire neighborhood that'll show which areas are, which, which uh, buildings are individually eligible, which ones are contributing as a district. Um, we're also partnering with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, the city of Waterloo uses a program through the state code called 657A, where we can acquire blighted homes 
Uh, we turned over two of those homes to Habitat and five empty lots over to Habitat. Um, and they'll be doing some new construction and they're rehabilitating. Habitat has basically expanded their program from just new construction to rehabilitation of houses now um, because of working with the city of Waterloo in this project. And of course, one of the projects that we specifically put in the perspectives to highlight was the All-In Grocers project um, <coughs> right next to the CBS um, outlot development um, for a new neighborhood grocery store. And there's some more information on the All-In Grocers. Uh, Rodney Anderson is here today. Um, they're getting ready to move that. They are utilizing new market tax credits for that project. Um, so again, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities. Again, going back to some of the things that we are doing along the riverfront, as you may recall, the city of Waterloo did the Riverfront Renaissance Program uh, starting back in about 2006. Um, of course, then it flooded in 08 when we started to tear apart the levee. That's just Murphy's Law. Uh, but we put a lot of public amenities along the riverfront, um, raising the dam um, by four feet to make it more boatable, um, by uh, creating the amphitheater and Mark's Park area. Back to the riverfront was our goal. Um, we created the river loop, which goes from 1st to 18th Street, basically a recreational trail. Now we're finally starting to see more and more of the private investment coming along to follow the public amenities um, to, to take advantage of the new riverfront site. And again, the city of Waterloo continues to aggressively go after uh, sites for redevelopment along the riverfront for riverfront housing opportunities and other infill sites. They have talked about a whitewater kayak course, um, basically going from park down to uh, 6th Street on the north side of the river. Um, we continue to look at that. Um, anytime you're dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers and all that, it gets a little bit more fun in the details of how to make those things happen. Um, but that's something we're continuing to work on. Again, the marina development, which would be just at the top of the street here on the left, um, next to where it says Cedar Valley Marina. Um, we are looking at creating a permanent dock system out of concrete down. There's kind of a cove there, um, maybe doing some dredging to create the cove a little bit deeper, um, but really working with some private developers to bring forth some commercial and residential development to that site that could also bring forth kayaking, canoeing, and those types of businesses down to the riverfront. Again, showing some of the riverfront housing and a little bit more of the Walnut area. Um, the city of Waterloo currently has some large sites along the south side of the river, um, really from West 6th Street over to West 9th Street. And then we also have a, the majority of the blocks going from East 6th Street um, over to East 11th Street on, along the riverfront. Um, this is a early, early drawing of some housing on East 6th Street. It was built a little bit different than that, um, but we have 72 units there. It's about a $7 million investment by some private developers. The LaPorte Road area, I'm going back to that one. The City of Waterloo um, is a part of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is basically the entity that takes in the federal road dollars every year um, of about $4 million. We work with the cities of Cedar Falls, Evansdale, Hudson, uh, Raymond, Elk Run, Evansdale, um, to divide up that money um, for road improvements in the area. Right now, one of the most major corridors we have uh, prioritized is the LaPorte Road area, basically starting up all the way down to Shawless, the Lost Island and Crossroads areas. Right now we have over $10 million, excuse me, we have over $10 million um, prioritized and, and set up for funding for that corridor to start. Um, we're under preliminary design now. So again, as we're looking at that corridor, um, there's some redevelopment opportunities there and we're probably gonna see a lot of improvements in the traffic flow and traffic movements through that area. image of the LaPorte Road area um, as it stands now. Again, there's a lot of there's a lot of nuances, I guess, to this corridor that you have Highway 218, then you have a frontage road, then you have but then you have a LaPorte Road, then you have a frontage road at times. And but also there's a lot of lanes in there for that amount of, of area. Um, so we're looking at reducing the lanes, creating some more um, development sites potentially, but also improving traffic where we need to get better stacking distances between the frontage road and the highway traffic conditions and get people to use that corridor. Again, going back to, here's a lot of the information on the opportunity zones themselves and how it compares to other areas. Um, so again, as you're looking at 
um, if, you're, if your particular project you'd be looking forward would be using Iowa Finance Authority tax credits or CDBG money or something like that, here's some data that's been put forth out there, um, which ones are qualified census tracts. The two downtown opportunity zones are both qualified census tracts uh, with the state of Iowa for 2019. Um, we're not assuming that they will change it for 2020, but we'll have to wait. And of course, then we also have other local programs in place to help for projects to move ahead. Um, as we noted, that we have the tax increment financing the TIF. Um, the LaPorte Road area does not yet have a TIF. We are analyzing that for the potential of that and looking at uh, projects. Obviously, it makes sense to use the TIF as a financing tool if we have the ability for some projects to commence. We also have the Cura, which is an urban revitalization area. Um, it's basically a tax abatement program that goes right to the county. Um, it's a very simple one-page form to fill out. You can get three years at 100% for improvements added in there, or there's a 10-year graduated scale that starts at 80% and goes down to 20% at the end of 10 years. The city also works and has some, play, has some programs in place to match um, other programs that you may use if you're using workforce housing um, from the state of Iowa. Um, we have what's called the WIP program, the Waterloo Housing Improvement Program, that specifically provides the match funds for the workforce housing. Um, we've helped with historic tax credits. I noted we're doing some historic studies of some areas to help with that. Brownfield, Grayfield. We also have a EPA assessment grant um, of about $400,000 that we utilize. So as you're looking at sites, um, we'll, we can come in and pay for the phase one. We can potentially pay for the phase two, and things like that to help you see that the site is developable to help you with those costs up front. Um, that is all the information I think I have. Any questions? At North Crossing, at North Crossing, no. Yeah. So it's closer down to downtown. Okay. Um, North Crossing is a former Logan Plaza. Um, the developer doesn't want us to call it Logan Plaza anymore. Um, for those of you that know about it, you'll know why. Um, but North Crossing was not an eligible area. And, and but that's a very good that's a very good inf good question in terms of I've had a lot of people that have had projects near the opportunity zones that have asked, Hey Noel, can't you just switch the boundaries? No, um, they are they're census tracts. Believe me, we've, we've had discussions on the state and federal levels about uh, the, how close they are and all this, and there's, they're specific to the census tracts. It was federal legislation that actually approved the opportunity zones, um, so we've taken act of Congress to change them now before the 10-year sunset. Um, so we're, these, are, these are the ones we have to work with for opportunity. So thank you for that question. So the, the, with regards to the historic Walnut area, um, probably about two, three years ago, um, the, the church's harvest, harvest vineyard um, had come and they've approached uh, Habitat for Humanity, they approached uh, JSA, they approached the neighborhood, um, neighborhood organization like Ms. Willoughby Wright and other people in that area. And they put together, what do you call that? The uh, the agreement? Development. Not a development agreement. They, uh, oh, we had a memorandum. So they, they came together and put together a memorandum of understanding with the city of Waterloo. And that was that anything that takes place in that area, they would like to be at the table. So we, uh, we for years, we had just been going in. When we see a blighted house, um, we go in and just tear down that house because you know, who wants children walking past blighted houses? We already had enough. And so anything that happened in that area, they wanted to have a say-so. And, you know, so that was a public-private partnership. Uh, they've been absolutely engaged. Uh, Rodney, of all people, can tell you the neighborhood has a say over everything that goes into that area. 
So, and Adrian, uh, we had Adrian uh, from our uh, economic development office is at all the meetings as well, but they're, they're engaged. And so what you've seen the other day with the old Judge Platt house, um, I don't know if you know, this house was um, completely run down. We wanted to tear it down. And uh, they ended up um, working with JSA, and JSA just remodeled that entire house, and we cut the ribbon on that one. So there's synergy in there. There's a lot of light. And when I went to Palo Alto, you know, um, other cities were talking about great projects. Uh, but the project that I focused on was, you know, All In Grocers by Rodney Anderson. Because, you know, it's good to have great opportunities on stories. But it's also good to see, you know, minority entrepreneurs that are able to be in the mix of recreating their own neighborhoods as well. So I actually, I won't say pitched, but I was able to talk about the historic Walnut area. I was able to talk about uh, 51 years ago uh, when Shepherd's Lumber Company uh, was burned down and how we've had some uh, flight from that area. But I was able to talk about how important it is to have public-private investments uh, in neighborhoods such as uh, Walnut. So you've been engaged, you've been involved. No, I, I got videos to prove it. <laughs> there, was, there was a thousand people in this room. <laughs> Other questions? Really? Yeah. That's good. I'm used to council meetings where we get a bunch of them. All right. Uh, so right now we're we are uh, proud to introduce. Um, um, first, uh, Mr. Rick Jacobs. Both of you are coming up. Right? Um, Rick's Rick's career as a Fortune 500. Uh, government and nonprofit executive underscores uh, the accelerator's mission to bridge the public and private sectors to connect people uh, with fulfilling work. He served as Los Angeles Mayor's Eric Garcetti's deputy chief of staff and, and separately founded and is a board member of the Mayor's Fund for Los Angeles, which in the past three years has raised $30 million, $32 million to modernize and support innovative strategies to connect youth with jobs and revitalize communities. And after working uh, with the mayor's office, Rick ran successfully Measure M campaign, which generates $120 billion for construction and operations. Uh, and so uh, Rick has an incredible, incredible resume. Uh, not, only, not only has he been a great colleague, but he's been a great friend. Um, they are here uh, because they absolutely care about the success of the city of Waterloo, and I've seen their passion in several different cities around this country, but I just wanna let you know how much of an honor it is uh, to have uh, Rick Jacobs here with us this morning. So, uh, you, are you both coming up? I'll start it then. Well, I gotta introduce, I gotta introduce Aaron too. So I, I started that off on such a high, right? I was like, come on up, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, I want to uh, introduce uh, uh, Aaron Thomas, who is the Director of Economic Development and Opportunity Zones for the Accelerator for America. Uh, he spent the majority of his career in investment banking, where he traded equity uh, derivatives and facilitated equity transactions. More recently, he worked in middle market private equity, 
before pivoting into the public sector, first as a fellow in the California Senate and now with the Accelerator. He's a graduate of Harvard College. I know it's not you and I, uh, but it's Harvard College and received an MBA from Stanford's Graduate School of Business. So uh, first, Rick, thank you for being here this morning. You know, it's an amazing thing when you write your own introduction, which just amazing <laughs> what, what nice people will say about you. I will say this, that uh, we're lucky. We're lucky to be in Waterloo. Uh, we're really lucky to be here. Um, everybody has an Iowa story. Mayor Garcetti likes to talk about how uh, uh, there's a whole group of people who settled from Iowa in Los Angeles, and um, uh, there are different people from different states who settled in LA at various times and those those neighborhoods sort of stayed that way in a lot of ways and I was reading a history of Los Angeles and there was a time when uh, Iowans would all get together and um, I guess people knew each other from here and so we're all uh, we think of each other as very different when people are on the coast or people are from not the coast but I'm not sure that's uh, that, that we are so different one thing that is different is you've got one of the greatest mayors in the country. Um, you really do. Um, Mayor Hart, uh, I think we met, I shouldn't say this out loud and I know we're not on camera there, but we, we met I think in, a, in a, a kind of a vinyl booth restaurant in Las Vegas. Now, that isn't exactly uh, the way it sounds, well maybe it is. So um, uh, Mayor Hart had come to our advisory council meeting in Las Vegas at the uh, uh, mothership of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners. It's a 1.3 million square foot training facility where uh, they teach people everything from underwater diving and welding uh, to, to how to build, to how to use lasers and modern technology. So uh, we've been honored and blessed to know uh, Mayor Hart and look forward to continuing to work with you and are really, really honored to be here. Um, so why don't I just tell you a little bit about, um, about what we do. So um, let's see, I'm supposed to do this now. Uh, I do want to refer to uh, two people that Mayor Hart already mentioned. Um, and one is Stuart Sunshine, whom you've seen, and the other is John Picari. And we're really, really thrilled that WSP has, which has been a big supporter of the Accelerator from actually day one when, when Stuart uh, and I met in a, in a restaurant in LA. And he was, he was very, very helpful, and his company has been. And uh, they'll tell you more about WSP, but the fact that they are here uh, on their own dime and are here as a, an in-kind contribution to try to be helpful in any way they can is a big vote of confidence in, in uh, everything we're all trying to do together. So thank you to, to uh, both of you. Um, so let's see. I'm supposed to do this. Let's see. You, you, you figured this clicker out, but you're, you're smart. Do I click there? Click so There we go. Okay. So what are, what are we? I mean, w what we do, to put it simply, is we believe that um, we have really great leaders and really great possibilities in this great country of ours. We believe it because we see it. We just talked about one, and there are a lot of others in this room. And so what we try to do is look for things that are local that we can scale and or replicate to help people deal with economic insecurity. It's just that simple. <coughs> And um, that, that's our job. So we do that. We're, we're as I say, we're a not-for-profit. Um, we try to, to to be helpful where we can, get out of the way where we need to. But that's what we do. Uh, does that work? There we go. So uh, on uh, uh, a November day, uh, two years or so ago, um, everybody knew about the top headline there from one as president, and. Um, but something else happened in Los Angeles that Mayor Hart referred to, and that uh, we were very surprised in some ways that it was such a big victory. Um, that same election on November 8th, uh, LA voters passed with 71.15% uh, of the vote, and I never forget about the 0.15. Uh, LA County voters, it's a county of 10 million people, voted to pass what Mayor Hart talked about, Measure M. Measure M, uh, M for Metro, uh, is very simple. It, it's a, a full penny sales tax increase forever. Now, we never talked about the tax. We just talked about the benefit. And the benefit is in a city that's known for traffic and known for uh, the pollution that comes from cars and so on, 
and known for what uh, freeways can do to cut a community up, what we did was we all said we're all in for 15 uh, rapid transit lines, buses, and but mostly trains and subways. Uh, we're in for road repairs. We're in for a complete transportation system and infrastructure system for LA County. It's the biggest local infrastructure and or transportation measure in the history of North America times two. As they say, 120 billion for the first 40 years. Uh, we have an advisory council. There's a notable absence in photography there, which is your mayor. Uh, we couldn't find a picture of the right bow tie, but it's a, it's a very interesting group. We have a lot of mayors on there. Um, I mentioned the uh, carpenters. If you look at the set, well, there's Mayor Garcetti on the left. Uh, uh, Jim Callahan, who's the general president of the operating engineers. Bruce Katz will talk about Anna Valencia in Chicago. Uh, Doug McCarran, general president of the carpenters. Uh, Steve Benjamin, mayor of Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, and, and some others you may recognize. Um, so that was our meeting. We meet through an advisory council. The advisory council actually votes on things and helps give us direction. And this, I don't know who that handsome man on the left is, but he, he shouldn't be allowed outside of Waterloo without that bow tie. But, uh, but this was our last advisory council meeting. We were in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, that's Mayor Garcetti. That's Mayor Woodfin in the middle who uh, is, uh, is a colleague, a real colleague of your mayor's. The same dynamism, the same energy, the same determination. Anna Valencia, the city clerk of Chicago, 34 years old. Steve Benjamin, I mentioned, from Columbia, South Carolina, now uh, chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and Andy Shore, the mayor of Lansing, Michigan. And these are some of our partners uh, that, have, that have provided funding and support to us, including our friends at WSP. I, I want to go back briefly. Um, this one, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, uh, just uh, gave us a million dollar grant for this work. And uh, uh, it's worth highlighting, the Center for Inclusive Growth is a um, subsidiary in a way at MasterCard, but it's all about not-for-profit work. And what they do, and what we want to bring to bear here and elsewhere, they have massive amounts of data, as you might imagine. I never thought about it before. They have massive amounts of consumer data. They know everything we do. And, and um, what they do is anonymize it. I believe they do that. And, um, and, and they can look at a neighborhood, they can go down to, a, 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 I don't know, 50 square feet, literally, and they can figure out where there's buying power, where there's spending power. And particularly with opportunity zones, that's gonna be very, very important because the whole idea of these opportunity zones is to be in places where people think that there's probably not much spending power, maybe there is, and that may be helpful for a grocery store development. So, um, look, uh, we, we, let me, um, I don't know if I'm gonna have a slide on opportunity zones, so I think we already talked about that with, with uh, previous speakers, but so I won't go into that in detail. I'll just say it this way. Opportunity zones are 100% supply side, right? I mean, they got passed, they're bipartisan. Senator Booker, Senator Scott, 2017 tax bill, here come opportunity zones, nobody knew that they were really coming, nobody knew what they really were. Now, a lot of, most people still don't know what it is. It's not a program, right? It's just a tax incentive. You don't have to apply for it. You don't have to qualify for it, not really, because you self-certify. You just can go and say, I'm in this zone that you all de de defined as how they <coughs> became zones, and I'm gonna, either use my own capital gains or I'm gonna raise money from other people who have capital gains, I'm going to invest. And the worst case scenario for an investor, if they hold it for 10 years, the very worst case is they deferred payment of the initial tax on the capital gains and they have zero tax on the gain on the new investment. So it is potentially a really, really powerful supply side incentive, but it is not a program. So we look at that as good news and bad news, honestly. Now the good news is obvious. The good news is that there's six trillion dollars, I don't know who counts the money, I've never counted that high, but there's six trillion dollars of capital gains sitting on the sidelines. And, and so uh, some people, Treasury Secretary estimated that you could see a uh, hundred billion dollars 
uh, come off the sidelines and invest in these opportunity zones. There are what, 8,700 of them across the country. Three right here, which is great. The other news, though, is that, and this is what I love about what we're seeing in Waterloo and what I love about your mayor and what I love about what's going on here is you all are being very intentional, and to your question, people are being very intentional. That the good news here is that people are being intentional, but the bad news is if you're not, then money's going to go where money goes. And it's going, people are going to make money with their money. That's what they're going to do. That's what this is all about. And, and so what we try to do is we try to provide tools to city leaders and others to help them be intentional, I think is probably the best way to look at it. So the first tool that we created, the first kind of uh, uh, offering, as it were, is this, uh, is this investment prospectus tool. And you all have done one, and you're in it, and you're working on it, and um, to your point, ma'am, I mean, coalesce stakeholders around a shared vision for inclusive growth, uh, organize assets for maximum social and economic impact, and, and, then, and then the first point that Mayor Hart made, he was out in, at Stanford with 500 people talking about Waterloo, marketing the possibility. Um, these are the cities with which we're working right now. We've got about 31. We'll be at about 50 by the end of the year. Aaron Thomas is the we uh, who was mentioned. Um, and Aaron, I just want to say, is uh, an incredibly valuable resource, not just to our organization, but to everybody who, who has the privilege of working with him. And I'm sure you'll find more out about that in a bit. You've seen your prospectus. Uh, and, and I know we're going to be talking more about that today. The other piece we're trying to put together, we will put together, is to kind of contextualize the different types of investment. And so we're going to put a curriculum together that we, we have, for example, a street corner thesis. A guy named Ross Baird came up with it. And, and it's pretty straightforward, which is if you find the right street corner, um, I, he's doing one in Austin, Texas, I can think of one that he originally looked at in Atlanta, you've got, you've got a street corner where there's a, 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 a kind of abandoned church on one corner, there's government property on two corners, but they're two different pieces of government, and there's, a, there's maybe a, an abandoned house on another. Well, if you can put all those four corners together, and in the case in Atlanta, the, the part, one I love, was he, there's a, 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 a sort of an infusion company, but it's a diabetes, uh, uh, treatment company. Well, most of their patients are in these opportunity zones, or a lot of them are. Move the company so that it's expanding there on one street corner. Open up, maybe it's a grocery store, maybe it's a restaurant, something else on another street corner, housing on another corner, and you end up with, with an intersection that becomes very, very vibrant. And then things can build around the intersection. So. Central Business District, you, you know, all, all of these sorts of things. We're going to provide people with sort of templates, I guess, as a good way to think about investments. This is the uh, other thing we do, organizing mechanisms, things like this, that we're happy to partner with folks. That's Mike Froman from MasterCard. That was our Stanford Summit. Technical assistance, financing charrettes that Aaron led with Bruce Katz uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. They had a, how, how big was it, Aaron? 300 acres? Yep. 300 acre, do you want to just say a quick word about that? Sure, so uh, Norfolk has uh, what's called the St. Paul's District, which is a 300 acre public housing uh, development from the 50s that has sat there un, uh, you know, unrevitalized since that time and is in, in, in real need of re revitalization. And so the idea was uh, bringing all the right people to the table to say, what do we need? What role does each person play? And then how do we move forward? And so. Uh, this is an impetus more than anything else. We believe, you know, opportunity zones provide the same purpose to get the right people around the table around, you know, a, a shared vision. And then, you know, we kind of come in and help figure out how to execute upon that vision. Uh, you, we, we've talked about this. These are the um, opportunity zone prospectuses. This is kind of the format we're using. Um, so uh, let me talk about thought leadership. Bruce Katz is. Uh, was for 20 years at the Brookings Institution. He's, he was at HUD before that with, uh, he was chief of staff for Henry Cisneros when he was the uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And he's a kind of a one-man uh, uh, paper generator. 
So um, Bruce is amazing and knows a lot about uh, uh, cities. I wrote a great book called The New Localism, which is how we got to know each other well. And uh, so we hired him, and he works for us and, and, and others, but he works for us at Drexel University and uh, is a great resource to us. And so he's leading a lot of uh, the, the efforts around thought leadership on all of this, on where development's going to go and economic development's going to go, we hope, over the next couple of years and, and well beyond. Um, here's an example, by the way, standing behind this building, uh, uh, standing in front of the building, but behind the building, behind the people, is what I'm trying to say. Here's an example of one of the first Opportunity Zone investments we've seen. When we were in Birmingham, this building, which is about 20 stories, blighted building, beautiful bones. The uh, mayor, Woodfin, who's at the podium, and his team in an opportunity zone uh, figured out how to finance something that had just been sitting empty. PNC Bank had a lot, has a lot of capital gains. They came up with 70% equity and the rest uh, various forms of debt and credit. And um, what, or tax credit type thing, but what they ended up with is this is going to be converted into 140 units of workforce housing. Uh, 500 to, I think, $1,000 a unit. And um, five of those units are for people uh, re-entering from uh, the criminal justice system. And this building is going to be converted and going to really transform a huge area of downtown where I don't know if anybody here has been to Birmingham recently. It's an amazing city. has a lot of empty buildings and a lot of places that, that need a lot of love, but a lot of opportunity. And so we do need to come up with a synonym for opportunity. So that's the first one we've seen. Um, in August, we're going to go to uh, Erie. They're doing a two-day, it sounds like what you all did here in Waterloo uh, uh, last week. They're doing a two-day uh, homecoming. and. Um, uh, so, because of all of this, of the work we've been doing, <coughs> excuse me, and the Opportunity Zones, they formed the Erie Downtown Development Corporation. Uh, it, it's a brand new entity. It has capitalized so far with $30 million, largely from the Erie Insurance Company, which is uh, uh, privately held there, I believe, and so there's, uh, they, they have a lot of interest in revitalizing the community. And I think we're going to see massive transformations in that city as a result of intentional, inclusive development. Inclusive, meaning it helps the people who are there. Uh, so here are some of our best practices. Um, so number one, designate a champion on Opportunity Zone. Seems like you guys are well along on that. Stakeholders to get input. Um, and and um, the leveraging of, of governance tools, what do we mean by that? Um, uh, the gentleman who's, hold us your name again, you run the city. <laughs> no, right. So, so uh, Noel made the point that the mayor's out there. He didn't hear that. Uh, uh, oh, yes, he did. So, um, <laughs> Noel uh, made the point that um, the city owns some property, right? That you're you're buying property, you own property. If you're being intentional about a plan, if you're being intentional. And because capital is going to go where it can go quickly, and it's going to go where it thinks it can make the most money quickly, and it is pretty much blind in most cases to social outcomes. So what you guys have the opportunity to do and are doing is you say, well, wait a minute. We've got this lot here. We can contribute the lot. We can do a joint venture. You can do whatever you want to come up with. You can do things around zoning. You can do other kinds of things and entitlements to speed something along. Those are the kinds of things that the tools that cities and counties have at their fingertips to try to move some of this money in a way that actually helps the people it was intended to help. So um, you, you'll see more of, of, of the kinds of things, best practices. We're going to need different kinds of financial intermediaries, uh, at, at creating networks, and so on. And so we've got all these things on our website. Um, I want to uh, close with uh, two points. Um, one is to thank uh, our friends from the federal government for being here. Because uh, I think that's a big statement, big vote of confidence. Um, I, I think over time, if this type of incentive is going to work, you all are probably going to have to have your sort of handcuffs taken off a little bit, I think, in order to be more flexible. I'll, I'm willing to bet that uh, SBA, but HUD in particular, 
has a wealth of ideas and uh, things that they can do. What we've encountered uh, sometimes is that the HUD folks want to do things and the regulations are a little kind of tough. But, but um, things like that um, uh, can, can make things better. And so I want to thank you all for being here. And then the very last thing is, again, I want to come back to um, thanking everybody in this room, but especially your mayor. Um, he is really a tireless promoter of your city. And um, uh, Waterloo is, um, people probably saw that uh, piece on uh, MSNBC, but Waterloo's becoming, becoming a place that people well outside of here know about, then that can only be for the good. So thank you for your time. John, uh, I know uh, you have a session a little bit later, but if you or Stuart uh, want to come up a little bit and talk about who you are and whatnot, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. I think it says, be ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so can we give John Picari a round of applause? Good morning, everybody. And um, uh, again, I'm John Picari. Stuart Sunshine, uh, Andrew Patterson. Uh, we're with WSP. Uh, it's a uh, large uh, uh, global firm that actually does um, engineering, land use planning. Uh, the group that, uh, that I lead actually works with communities throughout America, among other things, uh, uh, on uh, everything from urban revitalization uh, projects to economic analysis, um, uh, planning and, and economic development work. Uh, just very briefly, uh, by way of background, um, before joining WSP, I had the honor of, uh, of working for President Obama as his Deputy Secretary of Transportation. Um, it is uh, 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 something that uh, um, I learned a lot from. Um, I'm originally a local government person and, and have worked at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, uh, primarily focus at the local government level in economic development. So one of the reasons it's great to be here today uh, is you can feel the energy and the excitement and the opportunity here in Waterloo. And um, Mayor, you've done a great job of bringing together um, uh, a community and a common purpose. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, uh, about uh, uh, later on about the specifics of opportunity zones, but think of it as one very important and specific tool for your toolkit. Uh, it's, it's not a cure-all. Uh, it is something that is um, uh, that is new and very helpful. Uh, and when you layer it with some of the other uh, uh, assistance that's out there, whether it's HUD or the Small Business Administration, uh, uh, private sector, um, federal loans, uh, there's great uh, opportunities to, to put that together. What's most important is to start with a common vision uh, of where you want to go together, what the community's needs are, and to build around that. And I think one thing that we've uh, very clearly heard today uh, is that, uh, that that's where you're headed, that, uh, that, that together you can take this opportunity, these opportunity zones uh, and actually use them as a building block uh, for uh, your larger goals. And, and uh, so, that's the right approach. Uh, I will tell you that um, it, it's very clear to me from, uh, from my experience at the local, state, and federal level, the real innovation happens at the local government level. Um, this is kind of common misperception that it's from Washington on down, it is the opposite. Um, and Accelerator for America is one great manifestation of that because uh, it's, it's mayors talking to each other and shamelessly stealing each other's best ideas. And that's how it should be, right? Uh, so uh, w w one of the really important parts of what's happening here and, and what you're doing as a community uh, is, is that the change really does happen here and the innovation happens at the local level. 
And if we're lucky, and if we do it right, it later aggregates into national policy, not the other way around. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's important for everyone to understand that you're really leading this, um, and uh, that, that communities uh, uh, actually help themselves. And uh, uh, having grown up in Rochester, New York, uh, uh, a city on Lake Ontario that's had more than its share of uh, job loss and manufacturing loss, um, and, and watching it reinvent itself, <coughs> communities across America are doing the same thing. And so it's, um, we're, uh, we're all very happy to be a small part uh, of that larger uh, effort. Um, my colleague Stuart Sunshine uh, actually uh, started this whole joint venture with Accelerator for America uh, by uh, thinking about how we can put some sweat equity uh, into communities across America. And, and help them. And, um, and in, in Waterloo uh, and in other places, we're very excited uh, to do that. Um, and then finally, uh, my other colleague, Andrew Peterson, um, there's always someone behind all these efforts that does the real work. Well, it's not me, it's not Stuart, it's Andrew. Um, uh, and, and Andrew is a um, very bright, very committed, um, uh, recent graduate of the University of Notre Dame, who has, has been, uh, he's based in our Chicago office, he's been very engaged uh, in uh, leading edge thinking and work with both public and private sector clients uh, on things like revitalization. So th that's why we're here today, Mayor. Uh, we are uh, uh, very excited to, uh, to be part of this. Um, again, you can, you can feel the momentum um, and you can feel the kind of bootstrapping uh, here in Waterloo uh, working with uh, the, the assets and, and the community needs and using opportunity zones as one more tool, an important tool, but just one more tool that you have in your toolbox for that. So um, for that, we're very happy. Um, Stuart, did you want to add anything? Not at all. All right, well, <laughs> Stuart's much more articulate than I am. So, uh, but, but, but Mayor, it's, uh, thanks for the opportunity, and um, we all want to be part of something that makes a difference. Uh, this is one of the ways that we can do that. So thank you. Uh, but Ronnie had mentioned um, about having three or four people here and knowing one another and talking to one another and about uh, community. Um, and, but, but that shows the interconnected, interconnectivity uh, of all of our communities. Um, when one thing happens in one particular area, it has an impact on something that happens everywhere else. And I know today is to talk about capital gains and, and all of those particular areas. Um, but what the real goal and what the real mission is and the, the, the point is about being able to take care of communities, to take care of residents, to, to help one, and one another uh, as we move our communities forward. And I'm also not here for a campaign speech as well, um, but one of the things that I try to run on is to make sure that regardless of where you go in this community, you will see some types of signs of opportunity and progress, whether it's converting the old Logan Plaza into North Crossing right now, whether it's to see blighted downtown buildings transformed and turned into uh, incubator spaces for build for businesses uh, and more minority businesses, whatever it is, but uh, that has been the goal. And so right now we have a tool and we have an opportunity uh, to have more conversation. This is just the first meeting to introduce those that uh, may not understand how you can be connected. Um, but this is just the first meeting to try to get the ball moving and have conversation. Um, we are, believe it or not, further ahead in those conversations than other parts of the state that we live in. Um, but we have an opportunity to transform our community uh, through this tool, through this opportunity. And so it's all about learning as much as we can finding about where we can fit in. I know Kay will tell you we have been going back and forth to think about you know, how the foundations can particularly play a role in talking to Rodney about you know, how you can form this particular partnership to close, <coughs> to close any gaps and then talking to Rick and Aaron about you know, how can we get information to people to make a difference or with Rudy and community development about how we can change the housing landscape um, and, and it's not about moving people out, it's about keeping people in and helping people uh, feel included 
in these conversations and community transformation. We have an opportunity right now, like no other time in the history of this city, uh, to take not just a step forward, but to take a giant leap forward with the positive things we have taking place here. So that's all the challenge. Uh, that, that's all of you, all the challenge that we have right now, trying to figure out some of those key pieces. So um, I think Wendy is going to come up um, right now, because uh, I'm talking too much, uh, to come up and kind of uh, uh, talk about uh, where we're going from here. So this really concludes our community symposium. We want to thank you all for coming and it really on short notice taking a big chunk of your day because you believe in Waterloo and you believe in the importance of this project. What we're going to do this afternoon is have another session that starts at one o'clock. That's for partners and developers primarily. If you did not register for that, that's okay. You're welcome to come back at one o'clock and be a part of that as well. If you did register and you're saying, you know what, I think I've learned enough this morning and that's not for me, that's all right too. Um, you might also get back to the office and want to send somebody else along for this afternoon or get uh, send an email and say, you know, you really should be present this afternoon. Um, clear your schedule and go over to the Center for the Arts. That's okay. We'd love to have you back at one o'clock. We're going to be clear at the farthest door of the Shorts Room, clear at the West End. Um, so that's where we'll be. We might be a little hard to find, but um, we'll be in the Shorts Room. Uh, so again, you're welcome to come. For our distinguished guests uh, that have come a long way, they're going to take a tour. So for those of you, it, that does not begin till 10.30, so we will be, we have a few minutes to interact, do some networking. We will gather in the uh, atrium right out there where we, where we first met. The seating is limited. I wish I could extend the invitation to all of you to come on the bus tour, but it only holds so many people. And also, we're giving Noel a megaphone, so you know. <laughs> You, you may not want to be on that bus, right? I know I'm staying behind. Uh, I want to give, a, a, again, another shout out uh, and thank you to ISG for helping make this day possible. They are our local sponsor here, and uh, we really appreciate that sponsorship. Uh, the city can't put on events like this without their, their help. We also want to thank um, the Waterloo Center for the Arts for opening uh, up this space for us and, and the hospitality that they've provided. If you have a few minutes, take a look at the Haitian art collection. It is the largest Haitian art collection um, in the world. And we have people that come from all over uh, the country and around the world uh, to view this collection. So you are in, uh, looking at something very unique here today in this space. There's also another gallery um, just uh, adjoining. Take a look at that um, if you have time today. Again, um, thank you for coming to Waterloo. Thank you for making this part of your day. Um, we believe in Waterloo. We know that you do too. Um, I encourage you to, uh, to get out your phones and tweet something positive. Thank you.